Hi. This video is a quick guide for a Tetris game I created using Unreal Engine 4. I've made the game files available for download, so feel free to grab them and have a look, see how it all works, change things, and maybe improve upon them. You can find the link to the files in the video description. Once downloaded, just place them in your Unreal Projects folder. For me on Windows 7, this is C colon slash users slash Duncan slash my documents slash Unreal Projects. Now you can load the game from the Epic Games Launcher. At the time of this video's release, the files use engine version 4.10. And as you might have guessed, the game also works in VR with the Oculus Rift. You'll need to be using Oculus Runtime 0.8 to ensure complete compatibility, since that's the version that UE4 4.10 uses. Anyway, I'm going to do a quick run through of the major points, but not go into detail on everything. There's a lot of use of the blueprint system, so you'll need to be familiar with the basics. If you're not, then the official Unreal Engine YouTube channel has a lot of great videos to get you up to speed. When you load the game and open the level blueprint, you'll see all the different sections. The global stuff is at the top, controls, camera and collision detection. The purple sections at the right are cosmetics, like particles, audio, force feedback, things that are nice to have but not essential. The rest of it is the actual game logic, laid out in order of execution. I've also included lots of comments to make it easy to follow. So, let's begin at... Game. Start. Some actors that are used for checking are put into arrays so they can be referred to later. The menu is initialized. Then, if an HMD is enabled, its view is reset so you're facing forwards. But if there's no HMD, then the camera is zoomed in by adjusting the field of view through a timeline. In the control section, you'll see that almost all of the inputs begin by asking the question, are you in the menu? This is so that the same inputs that are used for moving around the menu can also be used for the in-game controls. I've created inputs for the mouse, keyboard and gamepad, and there will be instructions on what they are included with the game files in the download. To get in-game, select play and press the action button. The position in the menu is queried, and if at position 2, which is quit, then the game proceeds to quit. We're at position 0, so the path here is followed, and another question is posed. Is a game currently in progress? If so, then the game is actually paused, so you're redirected up here to the pause path. But this is a brand new game, so we move along some initialization until we need to know if there are any cubes from a previous game. If there are, then destroy them. Clear them out of the way so a new game can begin. After this is done, the event New Block Shape is called. Likewise, if there are no cubes, then New Block Shape is called instantly. And the game begins. Here, a new block shape is randomly selected from the seven possible types. A block is made up of four separate cubes, and in order to make a specific shape, we need to know where those cubes will be placed. This information is provided here, and stored in the cube start locations array for later use. Next come the rotations. The O, or square block, does not rotate at all, so this is set to zero. 
the I, S and Z blocks all rotate twice and in fact flip between those two states rather than rotating all the way around. And this is important and we'll come back to it later. The other blocks all rotate four times round 360 degrees. Finally, the spawn block event is called and the colour of this new block is also passed through. OK, so now the creation of the block begins by spawning the four cubes that make up the block into the correct positions. To do this, the information from the cube start locations array is passed into spawn actor my cube. Now, what is my cube? Well, if you go into the blueprints folder and double click on my cube, then take a look in the viewport, you'll see a model of the cube. It doesn't look like much at the moment, but if you click on it, you can see it's been assigned the material blocks. In the materials folder, double click on blocks to open it. It's a simple material with metallic and roughness values and a base color, which is set by this parameter, cube color. And as it says, this parameter can be changed by the block color value. This is possible because in the construction script, the blocks material has been made dynamic. So, the block color value is passed into the spawn actor node and applied to the cubes as they are constructed. This is incredibly useful because this single template can be used to create all of the cubes and blocks in the entire game. The base game of Tetris is pretty simple and it would be possible to keep track of where things are with an array or use box overlap actors to generate checks on the fly. Well, I wanted extra stuff such as gradually moving or rotating the block from its old position to its destination. Also specifically timed particle and sound effects and having the block shudder when it comes into contact with something. This requires a more complex solution. So invisible copies of the block are created using the actors from here. Then everything is set up in the setup actors macro. Just double click on it to open it up. Once everything's taken care of, the block is zoomed and rotated into the play area via timeline. Then some initialization. And finally, a timer to call the function timed move down. As you know, in a game of Tetris, the block is automatically moved downwards after a period of time. And that's exactly what happens here. The block action, which we'll look at in a minute, is set to move down. And then we enter an event which will determine whether the block is able to move or rotate. The first thing we encounter is the block check macro. So we're taking the block check, an invisible copy of the block, and adding to its transform, the collection of location, rotation and scale data that determines its place in the world. What's being added is coming from this second macro, block transform. Double click on that, and now we can see the transform data that will be passed through according to what the block action is. Remember, in timed move down, we set this to be move down. Well, according to this, that will leave the rotation and scale values alone, but give a location Z value of minus 100. Z is the vertical axis and the size of a cube is 100 by 100 by 100. So this will move down by one cube. Moving left or right 
takes x-axis values of negative or positive 100, while rotating takes from the y pitch axis, changing by negative or positive 90 degrees. I mentioned earlier that blocks with only two rotations actually flip back and forth rather than rotating around, and this is handled by these extra nodes. OK, so we've taken a z-axis value of minus 100 to move the invisible block down, which checks if the way is clear for the real block. Now we ask the question, can the block move or rotate? And then branch off according to the answer. Now, hang on, how can this variable know that? Well, we're taking advantage of one of the features of Unreal Engine, collision detection. If you take a look at MyCube again and scroll down to Collision, you'll see that Generate Overlap Events is ticked and Overlap All is selected from the menu. This is also true for the block checks. And if you click on the boundaries, the same applies there as well. This means it can be detected when any of these objects cross over into the space of another. So, using on actor begin overlap events for each of the block checks, the can move rotate variable can be set to false. And with on actor end overlap events, the variable can be reset to true. Returning back here, we now know whether it's possible to move or rotate the block. If it is, then we instantly come to another event, transform block, which is incredibly simple. We take the block's current position, the destination, and use a timeline to gradually move or rotate between the two. While that's happening, we're returned back here again, and the block action is queried. If it's moving left or right, or rotating, then the paths move on to purely cosmetic events. But if it's moved down, then the timer for timed move down is set into motion again, this time with some extras. Previously, the macro calculate weight to fall fed the time into the timer. Here, the variable weight to fall is used, but only as an option dictated by the falling variable. To get an idea of what's going on, let's double click on the macro to enter it. First, falling is set. Falling is when the action button is pressed and the block moves straight down very quickly. If the block is falling, then the animation speed of the gradual transform timeline is sped up by 10 times. That's the timeline here, and if we open it, it's 0 0.07 seconds long. If it goes 10 times faster, that's 0 0.007 seconds, which is the time that will be selected here when the block is falling. That means the timer activates as soon as the timeline is finished, and the block falls down in one smooth continuous motion. OK, back in the macro. The value here is different depending on the difficulty you selected in the menu. This value is in seconds, so if you wanted to make the game easier or more difficult, then you could change these values. As you make lines, the score goes up and the game becomes more difficult. To achieve this, the score multiplied by 0.01 is subtracted from the first value. And the result is fed in as the time for the timer. Next is another block check, this time strictly below the block and purely for aesthetic reasons. If contact is made, then it sets off an effect. 
So, what happens if the block can't move or rotate? As before, these options just lead to cosmetic events, while move down continues the game logic. We need to know, are any of the cubes above the boundary line? If they are, then that's game over, which is handled by the menu variable. The first part of this takes place at the top of the control section. Event tick is called every single frame of the game, and when menu is true, it shows the menu options and pauses these timers. Back down here, the game over audio is played, but only once, since there can be up to four cubes above the boundary line. Then after we've waited for the block to move and the effects to finish, the game over function is called, where the second part of the menu variable comes into effect. If it was set to true, then it's truly game over, and you're back to controlling the menu again. If not, then the block has come to a stop, and it's time to have a look at whether a line was made. First, detach the cubes from the block actor and each other. They were attached in the setup actors macro, and now need to be detached so that they can act as individual cubes. This will also come in handy later. The cubes array is cleared, because we're going to be using it in a second, and then the question, have all lines been checked? There are 20 lines, and we're checking through them all, one at a time. This is the first line, so that's false, and now we check the line for cubes. This is done using the line check actor which uses a variation on the collision detection seen previously. Here, any cube encountered will be recorded into the cubes array for later reference. Once the line is checked, we answer another question. Are there 10 cubes in this line? If not, then the line variable is increased by 1, and the line check is restarted. If there are 10 cubes, then it's time to destroy the line. The cubes are destroyed using an event in the MyCube blueprint, and the results are unique to each individual cube. The cubes array is cleared, since we're just about to use it again, when we find all cubes above the completed line again with the line check actor. Everything that was above the line now needs to move down to fill the gap and the set up actors macro is called again to prepare for this. The score is updated, line check is moved out of the way, wait for a bit, then transform block, which we've seen before. This is the same process that gradually transforms the block as we're controlling it. Everything's been set up, so the timeline takes care of things as usual. Wait, set off an effect, wait again, and restart the line check. This part comes into play again, detaching all of the cubes from the block actor and each other. This process keeps repeating until all the lines have been checked. Then it's back to new block shape and picking another random block. And that's it for the main game loop. When the effects event is called, the specific effect type is passed through, which changes what happens in each of the four separate parts. The audio samples were created from sounds I recorded for the previous video. Renoise was then used to craft the exact results I was after, and then the sounds were assembled using the Q feature in Unreal Engine, where you can have the individual sounds play differently each time they're activated. 
I have included the Renoise file and the samples in the download. The audio is then played at a specific location, taken from the block actor, because that's where the action is always taking place. Other audio events also play at specific locations, which is good practice for VR. Having sounds suddenly play in your head instead of somewhere in the world can be extremely jarring, breaking the immersion. Next is the rumble, which vibrates the gamepad at different intensities depending on the effect type. Then come the particles, which are spawned at specific locations, and that information is taken from the impact locations array. If you want to have a look at how the impacts are generated, then check out the Calculate Impact Locations macro and the various places that it's used. Also, Generate Rotation Impacts. Rotation is more complex and so requires some preparation before entering the macro. And there's also Generate Scrape Impacts, which is self-contained. Finally is the Shudder. This moves or rotates the block in a small shuddering motion when it comes into contact with something. It's applied to all of the cubes at once via cube zero, and it's done like this rather than with the block actor to prevent interference with the gradual transform. And that's pretty much it. There's a lot of other things I've not mentioned or skipped over, so be sure to take a look at everything if you're interested.